Tēnā koutou katoa e mihi ana ki a koutou, kua tai mai ki te tautoko, tēnē kōpapa. Kei te mihi aho ki a Kate Raywith, kōroa ko Andrew Fenning, ko nā kai kōrero o te rā. Tēnā kōroa, nō mai, haere mai ki tete, ke titai ohanga. Um, welcome everybody, lovely to have so many people on the call today. Uh, ko Kieran Fowley, tōku ingoa, he Manutaki Economic Strategy Director at Aho, nō reira tēnā koutou. Um, yeah, it's great to have so many people online today uh, for the next in our wellbeing seminar series. Um, I'm really looking forward to this talk and the discussion afterwards. Uh, if you've been following the series, uh, you'll be aware that it was launched about a year ago and with the purpose to provide insights uh, for Treasury's first wellbeing report. Te Tai Waiora uh, is one of four stewardship reports that Treasury is now responsible for producing and was published in November of last year. It's an independent report that uses the living standards framework and also had a wide order to uh, provide a high-level overview of well-being in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, it looks at the state of well-being, trends in well-being, and also the future of well-being in terms of sustainability and risks. And today's guests from the Donut Economics Action Lab add to a very impressive lineup of international and domestic speakers we've had the great pleasure to, to host as part of this series over the last year. So let me now please introduce Kate and Andrew, who we are absolutely delighted to have with us. Um, I think I read Donut Economics about four or five years ago, uh, and I am feeling slightly starstruck to, to be introducing Kate today. So Kate Ray Grawith is the creator of The Donut, a concept that aims to meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. She is also the co-founder of Donut Economics Action Lab, which is putting these ideas into action with communities, cities, businesses and educators. Her internationally best-selling book, Donut Economics, Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Economist, uh, has been translated into over 20 languages and has been widely influential with diverse audiences. Uh, Kate's also a senior associate at Oxford University's Environmental Change Institute. She is also a professor of practice at Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. And over the last 25 years, Kate's career has taken her from working with micro entrepreneurs in the villages of Zanzibar to co authoring the Human Development Report for the UNDP in New York, uh, followed by a decade as senior researcher at Oxfam. So I think we can all agree it's a very impressive resume, and um, we're delighted to have you here today, Kate. Um, Dr. Andrew Fanning is an ecolo uh, ecological economist exploring how to move our interconnected societies towards the goal of meeting the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. Andrew is a research and data analysis lead at Donut Economics Action Lab and a visiting research fellow at the University of Leeds. His research has been published in leading journals such as, such as Nature Sustainability and Lancet planetary health and he presents ideas and results regularly in different settings. So very pleased to have you here today too, Andrew. Uh, so the topic of today's presentation, uh, and Kate and Andrew will be presenting on the core concepts and tools of donut economics and sharing perspectives for New Zealand with examples from change makers from around the world who are turning, working to turn these ideas into transformative actions. Um, there are many synergies between the donut and the wellbeing frameworks that we have been using at Te Tai Ohanga, the Treasuries, being the Living Standards Framework and Hea Aroi Ora. Um, and these frameworks are all seeking to prompt advisors and decision makers to be thinking about the broader impacts of their advice on decisions, whether they be economic, social or environmental. Uh, and, and I'm particularly looking forward to hearing how the Donut Economics Action Lab has been working to, to with others to put these ideas into action. Uh, it's very relevant to our work across the public sector uh, to ensure we provide good policy advice by thinking really broadly about the issues, thinking long term and also thinking about distributional differences. Um, so just in terms of the logistics, uh, Kate and Andrew will present for around 45 minutes and then we will have the remainder of the time for questions and discussions. As our speakers present, please post your questions using the Q&A function uh, on Teams. And if you have any technical queries, please use the standard chat function to let us know. Over to you, Kate and Andrew. Uh, welcome again. Really looking forward to this discussion today. Thank you so much for such a generous introduction. And I know we're both really delighted to be here with you. It's late on our Monday night. I know it's early on your Tuesday morning and it's it's the privilege of this technology that enables us just to have a real conversation across such timelines um, and with such mutual 
frameworks and concerns and interests. So I'm really looking forward, to, I know Andrew is too, to presenting this and then to turning it into discussion. How do the concepts of donor economics relate to um, the living standards framework and indeed the, the whole philosophy that's been adopted in Aotearoa and New Zealand towards well-being? So I'm going to share my screen. Share my screen and take us into looking at donut economics in practice. Um, the, the presentation we put together for you is particularly thinking what, what can be useful of this is our practice, how can it be useful in the light of the practice that you have in Aotearoa and New Zealand. So I'm going to start with 20th century economics because this is how my education started and I think even if people didn't study economics at university, we've been affected by ideas from economics, all of us, in public debate, in politics, in the newspapers. So in 20th century economics, and I'm calling it 20th century because it's my very subtle way of saying I think it's really very out of date. The first diagram that we learn is supply and demand. It's the market, right? At the heart of economics, welcome to economics, here is the market. Supply and demand, that puts price monetary price at the center of our vision makes it the metric of concern that is apparently how we conduct economics with money as the metric and it means that other issues that matter get pushed to the periphery if they are external to a price uh, or external to a market trade so if you want to talk about pollution and, and damage to the living world it gets called an environmental externality and for me that's reason enough to move on there's no way we can do justice to the living world on which we utterly depend if we're going to refer to it in economics as an environmental externality. The biggest image of the economy is, is a diagram, and you don't need to look into all the details, but what we can see here is the idea of the flow of money going around and around, and the flow of goods and services going round and round in circles between households and businesses, um, and the role of banks and government and trade. But you can see just from this diagram, everything is a circle, it's self-contained, and it goes around and round. If I was to give you a few minutes to look at it, you'd quickly notice there's absolutely no mention of the living world. There's no mention of all of Earth's resources or indeed energy that are required to make an economy go round and round. There's no mention of the unpaid caring work of, of parents in a household, the cooking, washing, cleaning, sweeping, that enables us to get up and get ready for work and labour every day. There's no mention of the commons where people come together in community and co-create things that they value without money changing hands in many cases. If we're going to miss the living world, the caring work of families and the caring work of communities, out of the biggest picture of the economy. I think this can do no justice to what we know we depend upon and what we truly value. The selfie of humanity, the portrait of humanity at the heart of 20th century economics is called rational economic man. And here he is, I drew him. He would be a man, he wouldn't have dependence that he's doing the cooking, washing, cleaning, sweeping for. He's here, he's got money in his hand because that's how he interacts with the world through markets. He's got ego in his heart, a great big me, and he's got a calculator in his head and he's endlessly calculating the value of things in financial terms and he's got nature at his feet. He hates work, he loves luxury, he knows the price of everything. Not only is this an extraordinarily false and narrow depiction of humanity but the more that we are told that that model is like us, research has found that the more that students aim to be like him, they start to value competitiveness, they start to value self-interest over collaboration, over altruism. So who we tell ourselves we are shapes who we become. And then what we tell ourselves is our goal shapes what we measure and pursue. And the goal of 20th century economics was, of course, endless economic growth measured in GDP or gross domestic product, call it that, or national income. How, what is the value of goods and services sold in an economy over a year? And the idea of success is that that increases endlessly, no matter how rich a nation is, whether you're in Aotearoa, New Zealand, or in the UK, or indeed in Spain, where Andrew is, three of the richest countries in the history of humanity. But our politicians and our governments and our economic advisors so often tell that success lies in yet more growth, no matter how rich we already are. I personally believe that these diagrams have played a very substantial role in leading us to the beginning of how the 21st century has actually started with multiple crises that don't get cared for and attended to if we focus on markets and endless growth. We began with financial meltdown. We live in an era of climate and ecological breakdown, and I want to acknowledge the, the 
catastrophic floods and the cyclone that's very recently hit your country and the very real impacts that's had in many lives and communities. We're in an era in many countries of protest crackdown where people are rising up to demand the end of fossil fuels, to demand the protection of native and indigenous lands, and they are being repressed by police with water cannons, with batons. It's an extraordinary time to be a defender of the living world. And we've come out of two years of COVID lockdown. Now these crises get reported very differently in the news, but they have deep underlying messages that they tell us. They sh all show us how deeply interconnected we are with each other and with the rest of the living world. They hit people with vast inequalities of gender, of race, of wealth and power between the global north and the global south. And they all arise from systems that are based upon endless expansion. Financial system aiming to endlessly expand will create its own bubble that will burst. A system of human settlements and energy use and materials use that endlessly extracts from the living world will induce its own breakdown. And a human system that endlessly encroaches on spaces of wildlife for settlements, coupled with ever increasing travel between countries, creates perfect conditions for zoonotic disease transfer. These messages are telling us again and again, we have made a profound mistake if we think the shape of progress is endless growth. So how do we begin again? And there are many different ways, a pluriverse of worldviews. And today we're going to present one. It looks like a donut. That's why this is called the donut. You can see it immediately. We offer this as a compass for human prosperity in the 21st century, one way of imagining our way out of this crisis. So if you think of humanity's use of Earth's resources radiating out from the center of that circle, then the hole in the middle is a place where people are left falling short on the essentials of life, where they don't have the food and housing and education and energy and equality and income and political voice that every person has a claim to. I can say that with confidence because the world's governments have agreed in the Sustainable Development Goals that nobody should be left falling short on these essentials of life. That's where we crowdsource these from. That's a powerful thing. Every government in the world has recognized that every person in the world has a right not to live in the hole in the donut. Get everyone over the social foundation into that green ring. But, very big but, as we collectively and deeply unequally use Earth's resources, we start to put pressure on the life supporting systems of our planetary home. The nine planetary boundaries that have been recognized by Earth system scientists, we begin to disrupt the stable climate, the fertile soils, the healthy oceans, the abundant biodiversity, the recharging flows of fresh water and the protective ozone layer overhead. And so we mustn't overshoot that ecological ceiling. In fact, the goal is, as Karen said, as she introduced us, the goal is to meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. Leave no one in the hole and don't overshoot Earth's limits. The space we want to be in is the green circle in between. And it transforms the shape of progress. It's not an ever rising line of growth. It's thriving in balance. If I do it with my hands, it's like a heartbeat. And I think that connects us to the most profound and uh, possible metaphor that we have. We know that human health lies in balance. And if we can take what we know in our own bodies and take that from the human body to the planetary body, this I believe is the greatest metaphorical chance we have of understanding what thriving and prosperity and well-being means. It lies in balance. When I first drew this diagram in 11 years ago, in 2012, I was amazed by the response that there was to it. People just picked it up overnight and, and was saying as if I've always sensed that this is what a thriving, sustainable future looked like, but I'd never seen the picture before. And it made me realize the power of pictures. It gives people permission, gives them confidence, courage to speak to a new vision. And so I started looking at the pictures that many, many other cultures and indigenous societies have for millennia drawn of what thriving or wealth or well-being or health means. And I was just so struck that again and again across different regions of the world, across profoundly different cultures, this dynamic circle recurs. And so it's a very stilling moment to realize that the outlier is this Western, I'm gonna call it this Western mindset of endless growth. And there's something other cultures have long known about well-being, which is it's a balance. And so I'm wondering, the donut being a Western concept, I'm wondering if it can act as some sort of bridge between this growth-centric thinking back towards a wisdom that's been held by other cultures 
worldviews for a long, long time? Can it help us recover something and learn again from them and take inspiration and move towards something that repairs for all? If thriving is where we want to get to in that donut, well, we are very far from it right now. This is a global donut showing you the extent of people in the world who are falling short in the essentials of life. All of the red going towards the center is the proportion of people in the world who don't have enough food or water or energy or healthcare, measured either with one or two variables on each of those. Billions of people falling short on the very, very basics of life. And yet we've already overshot multiple planetary boundaries. The boundary on climate change, for example, is uh, 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We, we know we're well over 400 parts per million. And in fact, the Earth system scientists are soon going to be updating this diagram and telling us that, this, that with more information and more up-to-date data, this story is even more challenging. I can overlay this with headlines, right? And these are headlines from around the world in recent years telling us really devastating news about each one of these boundaries. And, and no doubt your own newspapers in recent weeks have been filled with local, nationally relevant, but equivalent version of these shocking headlines. And let's remember and, and recognize that when the life support systems of planet Earth are put under severe pressure, this of course has very strong impacts on people's access to water, people's access to energy, people's access to food, to security, to their housing, therefore to education, to healthcare. It threatens the stability, the resilience of all of the social foundation. The most shocking stat for me is that 1% of people in the world own half the world's wealth. There's absolutely no way such an extraordinary unequal world can move into living in the dome. So here we have a picture that shows us extreme ecological degradation and extreme inequality and in human deprivation. I do believe I really do believe our children's children will pull this image from the archive, pull these headlines, pull photographs from today from the archive and, and say, did you, did you know about this? And what did you do once that you knew? How did you help to turn this story around? Whether you were a parent at school gates or a teacher in the classroom or a CEO or the latest recruit or a minister or a voter, community organizer, what did you do in your life, in your action to turn this story around? What I'm showing here, if we want to turn this story around, I'm showing a global picture. So many of our stories happen much closer to home nationally. So here are four nations, and it was Andrew actually who created, along with colleagues at Leeds University, created these fantastic national donuts. So taking the global concept and downscaling at the best available internationally comparable data. And you can see four very different nations here. Malawi, a lot of red in the center, a lot of human deprivation, but without overshooting their pressure on the, on the planet, at all on any of those dimensions. You've got China, a double whammy of human shortfall and some ecological overshoot. I'm going to jump to the United States, one of the richest countries in the world. Still inequality, that's inequality that you can see in the center and a massive ecological overshoot. And then I'm going to come back to Denmark because people very often say, oh, but, but surely Denmark, no, surely Sweden, surely, surely Norway, surely Iceland. No, not any of these nations. Yes, look, it has a blue center of the circle, which means compared to the rest of the world, they have a relatively equitable and decent social foundation for all. Of course, there's deprivation there, but it's hidden in the midst of global statistics. But there is very significant ecological overshoot, as there is in all, all high income countries. Now, I know what you want to see, which is your own nation. I, you, do you want to see it? It's challenging, right? It's a, a equally overshooting planetary boundaries on all these dimensions and a uh, curiously strong overshoot of, of phosphorus, which is probably being used in, in fertilizers. Is there any country in the world that is close to living in the donut? And because this could be very disheartening. So let me give you some good news. There is one country that's closer than any other to living in the donut, it's Costa Rica. It's not there, but more than any other country, they're closer to meeting people's essential needs, almost within the means of the planet. And they've partly been aiming for something like this, but not fully on. What if nations actually aimed to do this? And we have to note that Costa Rica is doing this on less than half of Aotearoa's 
income and certainly less than half of the UK's income. So it doesn't cost the earth to have an economy that actually thrives within the means of the planet. In fact, maybe it's precisely because it doesn't have that economy that's possible. Let's put these together, again, using Andrew's fantastic data and graphics, put these together in a scatter plot where the place we all want to be, every nation wants to be in that top left-hand corner where we meet the needs of all people, but we do it within the means of the living planet. And there's your nation just to highlight it on that top line. Now, the, hi the history of interconnection between these nations matters, right? They're standing separated as on a scatter plot, but let's just recognize all nations are interconnected through histories and present day colonialism, through military and corporate power, through the power of trade and finance rules, through resource extraction and the current and future impacts of climate change. And although these impacts and relations are complex, we just recognize they've predominantly flowed from impacts created in the global north and affected those in the global south, recognizing there can be the global south in the global north. Just stepping back, the history of economic development has been in the direction of this arrow. Nations have seen their incomes rise, and instead of going into the donut, they've swept right past that corner and gone into overshoots. So the 20th century dynamics of economic growth, GDP growth, has been degenerative pathways, all the red that appears, and divisive pathways, still often failing to meet the needs of can we turn that around? Can we, can we do something completely different? Every nation needs to transform. And I would challenge anybody who finds themselves talking about a developed country. Yeah, there's, there's nothing developed about the countries that are in red here. There's nothing developed about overshooting planetary boundaries and undermining the life support conditions for all. Can we instead take a new trajectory where these lower income nations and we've got here Malawi, Tanzania, Uganda, Bangladesh, India, Senegal, can they rise and head towards the donut instead of past it on a pathway that's not been done before? What would it take for that to be possible and what would it take from support and enabling from the rest of the world for that to happen? So they don't have to overshoot like every nation before them has done. The middle income countries, I'm talking about China, Turkey, Russia, Mexico, Iran. Could these nations totally reorient, turn like 90 degrees in direction and start to meet the needs of all their people while coming back within planetary boundaries? What would it take to do that? That path has not been followed yet. This is a new trajectory. And then the high income nations, yours and ours and many others. It's very clear visually that what needs to happen in our nations is to massively reduce our carbon footprints and our material footprints on this world. And can we do that while, for the first time, meeting the needs of all people within these high income nations? That pathway is also an unprecedented one. So from every nation here, it's a trajectory and a, and a time of, I'd say, humility and unprecedented ambition. What will it take to change this? We believe that these 21st century dynamics, which will take us towards people and planet thriving, depend upon regenerative and distributive pathways by design. So let me just say what I mean by that. To change this future and to change the direction, we need to change these dynamics. We've inherited industrial systems that are linear and degenerative. We take, make, use and lose Earth's materials. That's how we run down the life support systems of this planet. We need to instead become regenerative so that we work with and within the cycles of the living world. We restore the carbon cycle by sequestering. We restore hydrological cycles. We repair our relationship to nature that's being depleted. And as you can see in this circular diagram, we separate biological and technical materials. So we allow nature to regenerate herself. That's how she continually reproduces conditions conducive to life. And technical materials, human-made materials from plastics or metals or ceramics, we mimic this by repairing and restoring and refurbishing and reusing and never throwing away because there is no away. This means we go from degenerative landscapes. We don't just stop, though, at this sustainable, which might be taken to mean zero further deforestation. We actually restore. Given how degenerated the world is, we need to restore and rewild and repair landscapes. 
And likewise, with technical materials, not just moving from built-in obsolescence to saying, well, it's 100% recyclable. Can we avoid the recycling by repairing, by modular design, by refurbishing and reusing, totally redesigning products to make that possible? So from degenerative, flying past sustainable through to regenerative. And then the second dynamic, we've inherited economies that are divisive. They have captured opportunity and value in the hands of a few in many economies around the world. That's why we've seen the rise of a 1% often nationally and globally. There's no way we can get into the donut with such a deeply divided world. We need economies that are distributive by design so that they share value and opportunity far more equitably with all who co-create it. And so in a similar way, we want to go and let me use a traffic jam here to make this very simple and clear and, and, and fun. We don't, you know, we, we, we've got a divisive traffic jam where each person is in their car if they can afford one. What we're not talking about is being inclusive, including buses in the traffic jam. That's the risk of what we create, an inclusive economy where everybody's included in a structure that's fundamentally broken. Can we go past that duck design to a distributive economy that has, in this case, dedicated bus lanes so you have fast, efficient, affordable, what's not to like, public transit that gets there faster than the traffic jam because we've designed for distributive design. So if I take from that metaphor of traffic, if we think about wages, not just moving from poverty wages to saying we pay a living wage, it's not enough of a claim to say we, we actually pay people wages they can live on. It's a very, very minimalist thing to be proud about. What if people earned not just a wage they can live on, but a profit share out of the work that they have contributed to? So can we go beyond near inclusion to a distributive economy and of course profit share is one of many different ways in which people could benefit within a distributive economy so from degenerative to regenerative from divisive to distributive these are the principles and when we first started coming out with them and when i first published donor economics six years ago places cities and regions would say can we aim to live in the donut and so i'm going to finish my section here by sharing with you the framework that we introduce and work with many cities now, over 70 local governments around the world are engaging with, whether it's from a town or a district or a city or indeed a nation. And I'm going to just imagine this in the case of your nation. So if we were to say, well, how could Aotearoa New Zealand aim to live in the donut? What would it mean to try to do that? Well, first of all, we need to unroll the donut. We need to make some space so that we can go in between the social foundation and the ecological ceiling. And we go inside and here's the question. How can... Aotearoa New Zealand become a home to thriving people in a thriving place while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet? That is of course a long and complex question and we break it down into what we call the four lenses between the social foundation and the ecological ceiling and we split them side by side from the local or the national where we have national aspirations and the global responsibility. So those four questions that, that, that overarching question becomes four separate questions and I'm just going to talk us briefly through these and then hand to Andrew who will talk about how we actually turn these with places into data so that it becomes a metric. So let's start with the national aspirations and the social foundation. How can everyone in Aotearoa thrive? What would it mean in your nation for, to know that everybody was thriving? in terms of having decent food, clean water, good healthcare, education, good housing, energy, community, mobility, connectivity, culture. These are the social foundations of a place. And what is a good standard and what is the standard that everybody should achieve is, of course, a conversation of place, a conversation depending upon the traditions and cultures and diversity in your place. What do we see as a good life here and how do we ensure it's possible for everybody? So that's the local social conversation. Then let me go to the local ecological. How can Aotearoa restore and be inspired by its own nature? And for us, this lens of the donut unrolled is inspired by the biomimicry thinker Janine Benyus, who, if she were with us today, and indeed if she were in your country, she'd say, take me to the wildland next door. So I've, I've picked here, I'm sure you can recognize, I picked a picture of the Wanganui River, but in different parts of your nation, different islands, Take me to the wildland next door and let's just see nature's genius here. Because in every place on this earth, nature has 
figured out how to thrive. Whether it's up a mountain or in a valley in the tropics, in the Arctic, nature's figured out how to sequester carbon, how to store water, how to house biodiversity, how to cool the air, how to cleanse the air, how to build and protect soil. So what is nature's genius in your place and what her ecological performance standards of what she shows is possible here? These become aspirational performance standards for a place. Can we build settlements and cities and towns that aim to sequester as much carbon as nature does here, that aim to build and protect soil rather than see it washed away, that aim to harvest energy, whether through growing food or capturing solar panels on the rooftops of our cities, that aim to cool the air on a hot day from the treetops to the forest floor. And nature can cool the air by about nine degrees. Can we create cities and settlements that cool the air in rather than create an urban heat island effect? So these are the local aspirations of a place. And it's for these reasons that people often say, surely Sweden, Norway, Denmark, because they know that they do pretty well on these local aspirations. But we need to put in context of the global responsibilities. What is a place's impact on people worldwide? And this is through the consumption-based footprint, through all the global supply chains to which we are connected and impacting people worldwide. So if we think of how can Aotearoa respect the health of the whole planet, think of all the supply chains of the clothing, the food, the electronics, the consumer goods, the chemical products, the construction materials that are imported into your nation like into every other, and the stream of waste that then goes out. This is the space of our impact on planetary boundaries. This is what is responsible for that red overshoot you saw in the national boundaries. How could your nation massively reduce its carbon footprint and its ecological footprint and material footprint to come back like every nation must within planetary boundaries to rebuild the resilience of place? And then still thinking of those global supply chains, who picked and packed the food we eat, who stitched our clothes, who assembled our phones in those supply chains around the world? Who are the people who are affected now by the excessive carbon emissions of high emitting countries and are impacted in, in droughts and floods around the world today? And then in relation, for example, to refugees, when people come, how are they welcomed? What's the policy? What's the culture? But also many other ways that nations can show solidarity with people worldwide through universities, through cultural programs, through negotiating equitable trade and financial agreements internationally to respect people worldwide. One last thing before I hand over to Andrew is just, and I'm going to come back to the local ecological here, because I know if Janine Benyus were with us, knowing what your nation's just recently been through, she would particularly emphasize that if we follow nature's genius of place and take nature's design as an inspiration for the places we live, that we will tend to be more resilient in the way we build, in the way we design and where we live and how, because nature has a resilience that we can learn from. And so I'm wondering if that might just have a particular resonance. Uh, what, what could we learn from how nature would teach us or inspire us or mentor us to design? So these are the four lenses and they can be explored either through community conversations or they can be explored through data analysis, which I'm going to hand over to Andrew now to take us through the rest of the story of what this looks like when we actually turn it into a data story and sent many examples of countries and regions and cities that are using this as a tool for transformation. Well, thank you very much. Uh, really great to be here. Let me just jump right, right in and looking forward to the discussion in a moment. You should be able to see my screen. Yes. Great. Then Kate just set the scene. Um, I, I have the privilege to follow up from that privilege or well, we'll leave it with privilege. But um, so this is the framework and it's a very, very, you know, somewhat complex framework when you raise these questions uh, and aim to apply them. But we're completely convinced at Dio that these are questions that underpin so much of the challenges and the opportunities that are faced in the 21st century. And they don't just go away, you know, if we if we don't ask them. And what we found with cities, with regions around the world, is that when you do engage, there is you start seeing interconnections and you start seeing things that may not have been so visible before. And I think it's similar to the living standards framework in that sense that it's not aiming to 
to provide a comprehensive assessment of any one thing. What it's aiming to do is map out a general picture and hopefully see interconnections across. So where did this come? Just a bit of history is that in April 2020, Amsterdam, at the height of the first wave of the, of the COVID pandemic, they published this report called the Amsterdam City Donut. It was actually after about a year's work uh, prior to all of this, but just the, the nature of time, it received quite a bit of traction in the media because Amsterdam was embracing donut economics as a means to build back better and really gathered a lot of attention. And I started at Donut Economics Action Lab actually one week after this occurred. And what the methodology really did was it aimed to lay out this data-led approach to answering these questions, identifying targets, identifying indicators, and making this portrait, this map, this snapshot. We followed it up just a few months later with a methodological guide trying to dive deeper and make available this methodology to anyone who wanted to pick it up and so that they could see the structure and see the, the reasoning and the underpinning, the methods behind it. And just last year in April 2022, we developed now five tools that are building on top of this, which we call Donut Unrolled. And as Kate mentioned, you can we envision by opening up this space between the social foundation and the ecological ceiling that it's a space for community conversations through participatory workshops, through exploring a particular topic. You can imagine putting it in the middle of this portrait, say a project or a strategy, and saying, how does this affect these, these four lenses? And as well, you can uh, present it through a data-led approach. And it's now being picked up, as Kate mentioned, in over 70 cities and regions and local governments that are engaging with this worldwide. So I'm going to speak a little bit about the data portrait of place, the methodology, some of the, the logic underpinning it, and provide some examples of places that are putting it into practice. So first of all, the principles that underpin this methodology, I think it's just important to note because in some cases, for example, those national donuts we saw earlier, it's it's a it's more of a comparative exercise. You want to take Aotearoa and and United States or United Kingdom or Costa Rica and compare them to one another. But with the data portrait or the donut unrolled method, we don't we aim to give up that that comparability in favor of finding entry points for transformative action that are meaningful for this place here. So we aim to be locally relevant rather than comparable between places. And with all of the donut economics type of metrics, really the core issue is that it's not just comparing performance with respect to someone else in another community or with respect to trends over time, although those are important, but it's also fundamentally, it's about comparing where we want to be, the desired outcome, versus our current performance. So we want, always want to have a vision of where we want to be in order to, in order to move towards it, right? Finally, with this, well, not finally, there's three more. With this issue, we want to offer a holistic snapshot for discussing complex issues. So again, not aiming to be comprehensive, but providing that, that, that broad overview that allows you to hopefully see things that possibly couldn't be seen when you have a more reductionist, more drilling down into the details type of siloed approach. We also, with it, want to create an opportunity for tracking progress, recognizing that a lot of these metrics uh, across these these questions have not yet been devised or they're not being tracked and monitored in the ways that are needed to address the 21st century challenges that we're facing. So, but we do believe that all those little white circles in, in, the, in the portrait, even if there's no data for them, just by flagging them and saying, listen, we know that health is important. We know that education, we know that climate change and housing biodiversity and storing, all of these are relevant, but if we make them visible, even if we don't have metrics, then that inspires people like me to say, hey, I want to find that metric. I want to do what is the best available thing that can actually measure performance with respect to where we want to be. So it's taking a long view and critically, it's not just a data led approach. We at DL are, are convinced that it can either begin with a data led 
method that says, OK, let's try and select as many targets and indicators as we can as an input to conversation to find those entry points for, con for transformative action. Or you can also start the other way around. You can have a more visioning exercise of say, where do we as a community want to be with respect to all of these? And then start using that to guide the data monitoring strategy that you would be looking to set up. So that's a little bit of the principles. Let me jump in actually just a quick note on the use of data, because again, oftentimes when we think of data, it's usually this very quantitative quantitative approach where when you're thinking of visualization, like those red wedges in the donuts, what you actually need is that your targets and your indicators need to be comparable numerically. And when you have that in the same units, you can divide one by the other to give an indication of shortfall for social performance or overshoot for ecological performance. But of course, that's not always the case. And sometimes the act of finding comparable numerical in indicators often flattens. It's, it's, it's really quite constraining in, in a way because you can, might have to throw away a lot of relevant information that you could otherwise assess qualitatively even if they're not numerically comparable. You know, you put things next to one another and just start to see a, you see, see a contour, you start to see a rough image, uh, which has value. Let's go back to our portrait. From the data portrait's perspective, really it's fundamentally these two core issues. What's our target or our commitment? And critically, is it ambitious enough? So it's not just saying, you know, what is the target? Okay, here it is, let's go. But ask ourselves, is this sufficient? And then, of course, how are we doing? Are we collecting the data we need? And again, there's value in noting we don't have the data that we need to be able to map our performance with respect to this target. Well, that's that's a useful thing to know. And actually, in Amsterdam, we found uh, one of the first the first lens that Kate presented there. How can all the people of our city thrive? That tends to be one of the one of the the lenses that are most most well covered. It's kind of what people are most familiar with because it typically falls within the general jurisdiction of of most governments. But we even found within Amsterdam, one of the most data rich and cities in the world, that they did not have an explicit official target for food until going through this exercise. I said, oh, well, we couldn't find one at least. And we can flag that and use it as an input. And then maybe someone from the food sector says, what do you mean there's no target? I have a target. And there's value to start that conversation. So what's our target? How are we doing? Across all of these dimensions of the ecological ceiling, both locally and globally, can we map those targets and also our performance? And the same thing across all of the social indicators, can we map those? And particularly in the global social, how can our city or our place respect the well-being of all people? That's an area that's probably the most grayed out from a data perspective, because for one part, we haven't been looking too much about the global supply chains and how how the things we consume here affect the livelihoods of workers and communities in other places or taking responsibility for them. But as well, there are so many other connections that aren't through global supply chains that we can also gesture towards, like, like international students uh, or cultural create cultural connections through history, through legacy, through just many, 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 it turns into, if I think visually, like a spaghetti plot of interconnections. So that's that's a big thing, but still needs unpacking. Let me dive into one of these lenses. I won't go through them all, and, but Kate mentioned the local ecological. So the question, how can this place be as generous as the wildland next door? If I were a data analyst approaching this, how do I start, right? Well, first of all, as Kate mentioned, like what is the habitat here? How could we consciously emulate life's genius building on the billions of years of experience that she has? And how could we aim to match or exceed nature's generosity? Where are those ecological performance standards and how can we collect them when we go to that wildland next door? What kinds of data could we gather and how? And there are many different approaches from going out, tromping out into the wildland with a with a mapping exercise to remote sensing to desk based research, you name it. 
And also we've added, you know, social connections. How can we make our relations to the wildland, to our, our healthy, thriving ecosystems? How do we make our relations with them also visible? Because we know that that too is a fundamental part of, of what thriving means here. So those are some big entry point questions. Kate already mentioned a bit of, say, I'm that little star on the left-hand side image. The healthy wildland next door is where we would go to identify the ecosystem services there. How is nature housing biodiversity, storing carbon, etc. And then, as I said, we can go off and map how the nature is doing, what are the ecological performance standards, and then assess in a site, in a project, in a city as a whole, even as a nation, and say, how can we aim to match or exceed that? In Amsterdam, we weren't able to do that for the whole city. So we took a, a, a different approach rather than measuring physically the, the, you know, the tons of CO2 that are sequestered or the number of species of, of biodiversity within a one hectare plot of land. We just said, OK, in this area, we know that it's a temperate forest biome that's also on a coastal ecosystem kind of influence, then generally it would be forested if the city wasn't here. And we know that forests cool air temperatures through evapotranspiration. And the city, does it have a target related to this? Again, we don't have something numerically comparable, but yes, there is a target around increasing the use of green space as, of, of, as green infrastructure. So how can we improve and increase the use of green space? And OK, let's take that. That's the best available target that we can find. We can use that to gesture towards where we want to be and how are we doing. Well, in Amsterdam, temperatures can be up to five degrees warmer than surrounding areas due to the urban heat island effect. So again, you start to get just a, a contour of how things are going, even if you can't necessarily visualize a wedge uh, in, in a donut type of framework. This is a whole, if we looked at all of the dimensions, again, I won't go through them all, but you can see the regulate the temperature example that I just showed with respect to cleanse the air, harvest energy, house biodiversity, build and protect soil, and start to build up what that could look like. And then you can start to think about how, how it can be visualized and communicated with others. So that's a little bit of the data-led approach. I'm happy to answer any questions or anything about, about any of that in a bit, but now I'd like to jump into some examples of how this methods that we've been describing in almost ideal terms have been applied and picked up by many without our involvement or just, you know, very, very light touch guiding, uh, mostly by my colleague Leonora Gertova, who's our cities and regions lead and how cities and local governments in particular are picking up this method and running with it. So in Barcelona, in Brussels, in Birmingham, in Philadelphia, Amsterdam, Thimphu, in Bhutan, in Ipoh, and many others. So as you said, there's about 70, 70 cities now that are engaging with this. So I'll just name a few because I want to raise Barcelona because I think it's interesting from a data-led perspective that they're actually probably gone the furthest in terms of quantifying each of the targets and the indicators across all of the lenses of the portrait. And then they're coming back around to, to visualize what that could look like and use it as a tool for communication. But they're also doing participatory workshops, they're doing demonstrator pro projects and others. They're really engaging with, with the full set of tools that I described earlier. In Nanaimo, they've developed the donut as really as a city compass that they've incorporated into their official city plan for the next 20 or, or 25 years. And they're now building up a monitoring strategy of what that could look like at the city level, of, you know, measuring targets, measuring indicators of performance. And critically, when they're thinking about forward looking approaches, saying, how can we envision, OK, policy A, policy B, policy C? for example, for transport or for, for mobility or for the built environment, then how can we overlay different policy options and do some scenario analysis and use the donut almost as a, as a, as a guiding tool through that whole scenario development process? In Cornwall, where they've developed, I think, relevant for, for this conversation in particular, a decision-making compass, which essentially 
just takes the, it's a decision making wheel where we can imagine a project or a strategy or some type of decision that needs to be made and imagine how, what are the impacts on different dimensions of the global donut in this case or, or of the ecological ceiling and the social foundation. And also they've now built upon that, and again, this is legislated now, I believe, to, to create software which allows the city staff at least to to start inputting whether they think it would be you know moving towards more closer to the ecological ceiling or closer to the social foundation if they're falling short and using that again as just a very simple visualization trick to show trends and directionality there's the government of bhutan which is looking at regional planning which i think is a uh, a great example here because in Aotearoa has the the living standards framework and many other frameworks, uh, indigenous Maori led frameworks, and Bhutan as well has is quite famous for the gross national happiness framework. And but they too have invited donut economics to 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 see how the tools and the concepts can be integrated into their own frameworks which they are holding and and dealing with and we've run some with some workshops there with city planners which were which were fabulous community and stakeholder engagement this is where i mentioned those participatory participatory workshops those those exploring a topic this is an area that's hugely inspiring. Our colleague Rob Shorter, who's a communities and arts lead, is developing a ton of activities, particularly that are very physical, that allow you to step into the donut that you can see in the middle photo there. They've, they've got the portrait up on the wall on a window and they're mapping post-it notes onto it. And here's in Brussels, they, they did a, a street a street event where they're handing out donuts to actually members in Brussels, uh, members of the European Parliament and others who were there. And it's just a very, very, very inspiring to see these things coming out. And in Birmingham, there's there's an amazing organization called Civic Square, who's really looking at neighborhood transformation. They're in the neighborhood of Ladywood and they're using the four lenses to and, and many more tools to really think deep and to think long in terms of engaging with their community and how they can think about social and ecological performance and towards a vision of thriving. So there's a few examples. Once again, my colleague Leonora is really picking up the many different entry points that cities and regions and local governments in particular are approaching these tools and these concepts, whether it's as a strategic compass or as a to use it to assess a sectoral policy or strategy, a data led approach, decision making as a community and participatory outreach activity or empowering local residents through demonstrator process projects in in urban in the built environment in particular and and also as a as a tool to identify levers for transformative change so i feel like i've just given a lot i want to take a step back to as far as we've gotten so far, where we're talking about 21st century economics. We've left 20th century economic man and economics far behind. And so just to remind ourselves, we've offered the vision of a donut, about regenerative and distributive dynamics, about the need for all nations to transform. And finally, if we were to land that here in Aotearoa, what could that look like and how could we start mapping that future here with respect to all of that. That's a, a little bit of how we're engaging with cities and with governments in particular from a data led approach, as well as some of the core concepts and principles. We're also working with business, with communities in schools and education. And it's really uh, we just wanted to share these final comments of saying, how can we take the ideas of of a book and start putting them into action? Here's Here's our website where you can see the the community of practitioners who has now who is now gathered around these and start building tools and concepts and sharing back these innovations with others. So I'll leave it there. I will ask if Kate has any final comments to to wrap up and then. Great, then let's open up the conversation because we have been going for a while. Thank you very much. 
Oh, kia ora, Kate and Andrew. Um, thanks very much for, for a fascinating talk. I think um, you've offered up some really challenging insights uh, for New Zealand um, at the moment as well. Um, you know, partly about how pervasive the issue actually is, but you've also complemented that with uh, particular ways we can approach the issue, which if I can summarise, I've sort of got down to asking the right questions, setting the right targets and really objectively assessing how we're doing. And throughout that process, really drawing from what Mother Nature can tell us about keeping our communities and habitats in balance as well too. So I think that was a Plenty of food for thought there, and I can see the questions starting to come through. Uh, we do already have some questions in the Q and A, so please keep them coming in, and we will try and cover as many of them as we can through the next twenty odd minutes, twenty five minutes. Um, so the first one, I'm going to couple up a couple here. Um, there's there's a there's just a, a technical question about when we look at the the reds and the overshoots and the undershoots and the donut. Is that on a per capita basis or an absolute basis? But I think uh, the, the possibly a, a a, a more um, a more substantive question around is how should we allow for the fact that New Zealand produces food for many people overseas and linked to that I think is a question that's come up about how do we integrate the planetary boundaries concept against a global framework in this case the Paris Agreement uh, that doesn't integrate cross-border consistency through the absence of embodied emissions within imported goods so there's a bit of that supply chain I think issue that you started to raise there so I'd be really interested in your perspectives on those questions. Shall I? Yes, I shall. Um, so very quickly, the the national donut metrics are on a per capita base. The ecological indicators are on a per capita consumption based like environmental footprint metrics. So in terms of allowing for the fact that New Zealand provides food to many other countries, that's essentially captured by taking a consumption based approach. So most simply, it's it only counts the territorial, say it's nitrogen, nitrogen emissions or CO2 emissions. It would only count the emissions that take place within the country, plus the imports, minus the exports. And of course, it also takes into account all of the upstream, upstream emissions embodied within it as well. So that's, I guess, how we how we allow for it is by by taking that consumption based approach, we essentially say that responsibility for environmental burdens ultimately lies with the final consumers of those who, who consume the goods and services. That being said, that's not the only responsibility metric and there sometimes there is grounds for for a territorial approach, particularly because in the current world that we live in, that's often where where political jurisdiction lies. So I think when it comes to the IPCC uh, framework, they adopt a territorial territorial emissions approach, uh, often because those are emissions that a nation, as an entity, is, I guess, easiest to control from a government's perspective. I guess, and so that's that's. That's how I wanted to to mention those. Oops, you're muted. A slight technical snag, unfortunately, in the sense that I have lost access to the Q and A. So I'm just going to lean over and read off someone else's computer here. Um, I think there was a question about links with the uh, SDG goal, which I shall just try and find here as well. So, so how does the data portrait link into tracking progress with the SDGs? Shall I? Shall I? So how do we look into tracking progress with the SDGs? Well, with the, the social priorities, the they're essentially derived from the SDGs themselves. So they're not mapped exactly to all 169 or 172 uh, indicators of the Sustainable Development Goals database framework, but the dimensions they are, and oftentimes there is there is some overlap. Well, there is definitely some overlap in terms of the specific metrics that are covered. But once again, it's the data portrait itself doesn't aim to be that comprehensive focus that is 
sometimes sought with like if I look at the SDG database, for example, and you see if we're going to talk about health or about education and there's there's 15 or 20 or 25 indicators to kind of drill down deeper into those into those goals. The data portrait as we've currently designed it, it's not aiming to provide that drilled down detail, but of course many of those dimensions as we call them are also part of the sustainable development goals. So there are 12 social priorities of the sustainable development goals and 12 social priorities of the global donut, which we've also added several others in terms of uh, mobility, in terms of community, equality and diversity is another one that we've added in the data portrait because uh, it's the SDG on gender equality is is to be celebrated, but it can be missing other forms of, of discrimination of inequality. And so we've added added that one there. And when it comes to the ecological indicators, there's uh, there's obviously clear overlap as well with CO2 emissions with like on land, like on water. And but we derive directly from the planetary boundaries for those. Can I just jump in? that's on the on the SDGs so I often will say you know people say what's the connection between the donut and the SDGs and I would start by saying well they're cousin concepts and in fact I know that the donut was on the table when the SDGs were negotiated some people who were in the last hours of negotiating said we had the donut there to keep our sights on the big picture and not end up haggling over where the commas should be in the text uh, and, and then when the SDGs came out I remade the donut using the SDGs to create that social foundation as Andrew's describing. So they're cousin concepts and a nation that was sincerely aiming to do one or the other would probably be going in a positive direction on both. Let me put positively that way. And yet, I think as Kelly mentioned in the chat, I saw a comment jump up and I'm, I'm just going to pick up on that. There is a lot that I think doesn't get picked up in the sustainable development goals. For example, high income nations, when they look at their SDGs, I understand they will focus on what is our food and health and education and housing and income situation, but the donor unrolled has that global social lens. What is the impact that we're having on people worldwide? It asks us to look structurally at our relations through global supply chains, through global trade agreements, through the impacts of climate change that we create. And so it take us us to take responsibility for in things that might seem intangible because they're they're distant and therefore apparently invisible, but very, very tangible in other people's lives. And uh, I think it, the Donut Unrolled does a more nuanced job of looking both at planetary boundaries and the local ecological conditions. And then the one difference, something the SDGs have that the Donut doesn't have, is under target eight in the SDGs, goal eight, the pursuit of growth, right? So it has decent work and economic growth. And we think it's just misplaced to say that a goal for every nation in the world, as I said earlier, those rise nations, absolutely, I will bet my money that they need growth in order to meet the health and education and housing and food and mobility needs of all people. But to claim that across the nations in the world that they should have a goal of growth, we think is misplaced. They should have a goal of being regenerative and distributive by design and then question, how do we do this? How do we overcome our growth dependency? in order to get to where we actually want to be. Thanks, Kate. I mean, I think just sticking a, a little bit with this context of the the, the, the kind of more the, the multilateral institutions here, there's a question here around the right hand lenses in the model require all nations to recognise their interdependence with and indeed responsibilities to all other nations, yet populist and nationalist path, uh, policy agendas would work against this. How do we build the kind of international geopolitics that is needed to do this properly? So you've talked about clearly your involvement in the in the SDGs, but just more broadly, how can we build those sort of international geopolitics that help us um, move uh, towards taking a, a broader view of our worlds? We think it starts by naming it, by showing it, by making it um, and that's why when we do the donut on rolls, it's all there. And actually, I'll tell a nice story from Amsterdam. I'm not, this isn't now international geopolitics, but every every place is connected the whole world. And when we first did this framework with Amsterdam, um, they were very excited about doing the framework, but we created, and as Andrew described, we, have, we worked with them to create their first city portrait and the local social data and the local ecological data. And, when it, and, and the planetary boundaries data and how Amsterdam was overshooting its carbon emissions and how Amsterdam was overshooting its material footprint. But then when we filled in the global social story about, and for example, we, we said, well, how can we tell this? Well, we know that, for example, the port of Amsterdam 
is a major importer of cocoa, which is coming from West Africa, where there are plantations where we know there's modern day slavery and child labor. So we cited statistics, academically researched statistics through global supply chain work. Uh, we talked to examples of workers in garment factories who are producing garments for brands that are on sale in that city as they are in all cities or all high income cities. Now, when we first presented this lens to the policymakers in Amsterdam, the first reaction was, oh, no, 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 this is horrible. This isn't us. This, this, this doesn't feel like us. Take it away. It will never get approved by council. And we had a long conversation to say, well, you know, you see your, you, you see your ecological footprint your and your carbon footprint. You, you've somehow come to terms with this is you uh, overshooting planetary boundaries, the ecological degradation of the world. This is part of you. In fact, talking to Amsterdam, this is why you're home of many fair trade companies, you're home of Fairphone, you're home of uh, the Clean Clothes campaign, a major, major campaign to, to, for global supply chains to clean up their labour rights abuses. You're home to many campaigners and organisations that exist to deal with these problems. They must be real. And to their great credit, the, the uh, Deputy Mayor of Amsterdam, she turned 180 degrees and saw the importance of recognisers and then became a champion of talking about it. So it's about showing it and sitting with it. And it's uncomfortable to look at it and say, this is part of who we are. And we're not going to manage to transform it all overnight, but we need to take responsibility for that. So we think it's really important through the visuals that we're sharing, for example, those scatter plots, of that scatter plot of all those national donuts that Andrew's created. I've watched the faces of Norwegians and Swedes and Danes when I've shown that, and there's literally a, a, the, the sort of draw, jaw drop. Is that really us? Even we, you know, even we think we are, with, with the Scandinavians, we're almost perfect, aren't we? Isn't that who the world thinks we are? And the jaw drop of seeing this visual data and seeing the impact on others. So it's really important to create visuals that make it visible. I think the naming that we've done, so we're talking about the rise nations, the reorient nations and the reduced nations. We're trying to come up with new words for clusters of countries where developed and developing just doesn't mean anything in this context and, and, and those countries that are claiming these words really don't deserve to claim to be developed or advanced. So we need new, new, new metrics and that's what Andrew's focused on, produce the metrics that make visible the reality of the 21st century. We need new framings of words and, uh, and then we need politicians who actually have the the guts to stand up, and I would say Jacinda Ardern is absolutely one of them, um, and, and invited me to your nation to, to share these ideas in a, in a public, uh, public debate. Uh, in Wales, in Scotland, in Iceland, there are national leaders who have said, we're not going to try to be the biggest economy in the world. We want to be a well-being nation, we want to be a well-being economy, and we're embracing a different vision. And it, I don't think it's a coincidental piece of the nations I've just mentioned have all been led by women at the time they made this uh, ambition. So we need new groups of countries to stand for a different vision, stand for a well-being economy, which is the donut aims to speak to. And we need the analysis and the metrics and bring together the evidence of policies and places that are actually doing this. Going back to a slide Andrew showed earlier, the one thing we've really learned that has power is peer-to-peer -peer inspiration. So for all the times that Andrew and I could present this and stand on a stage or go on television and talk about what if you're aimed to live in the donor, it doesn't touch what happens when the Deputy Mayor of Amsterdam says, well, we've decided to adopt the donut because it's the best model, obviously, to bring about the transition we, need, we know we need and we want to make. Other mayors in places listen to that with a different quality of inspiration. And what we think we're seeing now, we've been doing this for three, four years, this, we're being contacted more by nations, like yourself, we're not by cities. It's been city, cities, and it's now nations that are getting in touch. We're now seeing national MPs from Singapore to Barbados to other countries speaking to this vision. And we think that nations are seeing things emerging within places. And again, it builds critical mass, it builds confidence that there is a different vision that's possible. And that's why we're so happy to be in this conversation with you and others of how can these ideas help inspire transformation we know is necessary at the national level. 
Thank you. I mean, I think I can probably riff a little bit off that and use one question and also a question I had myself, which is sort of talking about the nation side of things. So the question is here about how do you see people like those on this seminar changing the actual policy and economic frameworks that we're actually using in New Zealand? So you've talked a bit about the show and tell sort of and sitting with it uncomfortably part, but anything else I think you can offer from a New Zealand perspective would be great. I think that the related point to that is that a lot of what you've shown us, as you've said, is very much community based or city based. How do we kind of apply these types of concepts in much more of a, a, a national level um, in this space as well? Great. So first of all, let me give the caveat. Of course, I'm not close enough to national policies to really try and come in incisively. But let's say that what I think is relevant, of course, many all high income countries. First of all, thinking about how to ensure that let's look, think about that local social again, the provisioning of health, education, power and food. What is the balance in your nation, as in any country nation, between saying, and I think we've had uh, 30, 40 years of a very neoliberal agenda that says, well, markets first. Um, let me just take housing. In many high income cities and nations, there is a, a crisis of affordability of housing. Young people say, I can, I can, it's a joke. I can't get on the housing ladder. There's no bottom rung. I can't possibly hope to get out of renting. Now, the city of Vienna, over 60% of people live in what we would call social housing. It's housing owned either by the city or city-run cooperatives because a century ago, Vienna decided that housing is not a luxury investment asset for landlords. International asset managing companies can swoop in and buy up tens of thousands of units and houses and then rent them back to the population. They decided, no, housing is not an investment asset. It's a, it's a human right. And therefore, we're going to make sure that it's owned in a way that it enables it to be human right. So that's a profound question of who owns the land and housing and how is it being managed? Is it being managed to deliver returns to the owners of that wealth or is it actually being managed to ensure that everybody has the right to housing? And then taking that into health and education and other public provision. What about transport? Transport enabling everybody to have affordable, good, low carbon mobility. So I would say there's that zone. But then let's come to carbon emissions. Does your nation have a carbon target Carbon, carbon, getting to net zero and beyond on anything that's like the scale that we all should be pursuing now, the ambition, and not just saying, well, we'll all sort of sit back and get that by 2050. I, I, I find it bizarre when, well, not just bizarre, but totally inadequate when high income nations like my own say, well, we'll get that by 2050 because that's the goal. It's like the, you know, the, the, the most powerful member saying, well, I'm happy to come at the back of the race with everybody we should be leading because of historical responsibilities, as well as having really ambitious carbon uh, cuts and carbon reduction, material reduction. So I'm going to go back to the Netherlands. The Netherlands has said, we want to be 100% circular by 2050. I love that because nobody knows what that could possibly mean. I mean, we know you can't be 100% circular, but that ambition, it's like, let's get to the moon. No, we don't yet know how we're going to get there, but the point is to aim, we will figure out the materials and the means. Let's go for circularity and we'll figure it out. But not just having this distant 100% future. They said we'll be 50% circular by 2030. So the materials that are being used and reused in our nation, half of them will be circular in use within a decade. And then Amsterdam have said, and then by this year, 10% of government procurement contracts will be circular. So you've got long term vision, mid term ambition, immediate market opportunity for the front runners, and bringing those kinds of um, ambitions in. And I would have thought a nation like yours. Bringing in a circularity ambition at first, it seems confronting and overwhelming, but actually what can we do here? How can we redesign? How can we transform so that we actually become far more effective of reusable production? And it creates jobs because it brings hands, it ha brings hands back to materials, it reconnects us with the things we use. So those are just a few things that I would immediately say. Where, and, and I don't know the answer, so I'm not asking this rhetorically. Where is New, where is New Zealand's ambition? on carbon emissions cuts. Where is New Zealand's ambition on becoming a circular economy? We know that all high income countries need to do a lot on this. Do we drag our feet and be the last or do we actually move ahead and turn it into an opportunity? That's great. Thank you. I mean, I think along a similar question here, which is um, 
which would be just interesting to get your perspective on. I guess the challenging part of this is could you outline the relationship of donut economics as a tool to the concept of degrowth? So in terms of kind of the way you're thinking about circularity, I guess, how does how does that actually relate to growth? And are we talking about degrowth? And the question here, and apologies, I have to keep looking at another computer because mine stopped functioning. Is should Aotearoa's treasury be considering degrowth if our aim is to be within the social foundation and planetary boundaries? Well, we were wondering whether this question came up and we prepared a couple of extra slides um, just in case, and I'll share them in a moment. But just going technically, the, the, the definition of actually, Andrew, do you want to share those slides? I'll tell I'll tell the story of degrowth and, degrowth, and then you can bring in the, the, the data break. Um, so degrowth. So when people first hear this word, they would understandably think degrowth must mean GDP going down. And I think people often think that because it sounds like opposite of against growth. If we listen to the leading thinkers in the degrowth movement, such as Jason Hickel or Timothy Perry, here's how they define degrowth. It is a planned reduction in production of less necessary um, goods, luxury, so that we come back within planetary boundaries. And we do it at the same time as meeting the needs. So we, we do it in a just way. So when I hear that, I think, well, that's not very far away from high income country coming back into the dome. So it's the degrowing the material impact in the world. That's what the focus is on. And the reason why it's seen as uh, very radical or very challenging is because actually very similar to donut economics, it says it calls into question whether or not one can endlessly pursue GDP growth at the same time. So the dream is, the dream of, men, I say dream uh, in, in some inverted commas, the dream of many mainstream economists is green growth, right? We need to green our economies, we need to use less carbon, we need to reduce our material footprints, but surely we will do that with ongoing growth because we've inherited economies that are structurally dependent on this growth. So the dream is we can keep GDP rising up and up and up, and we'll reduce carbon emissions and material footprints efficiently. And we like degrowth as deeply question whether that's going to be possible. And I'm just going to pass over to Andrew to share some data that we here's some we made earlier. Andrew is muted. You can see my screen, yes? Yes. yes. So if we think about this question of, of green growth, uh, this data is from the website Our World in Data, which is a great resource for tracking in particular carbon emissions. And we can look at GDP and we can look at both consumption based as well as production based emissions. And we can see, in fact, a, a decoupling, as it's as it's called, a decoupling, meaning that GDP growth is is increasing, whereas uh, carbon emissions seem to be kind of flattening over the over this period. So that's what we would call a a decoupling or a relative decoupling. And here on the right hand side, you can see there's quite a number of particularly high income nations that have been reducing their CO2 emissions as growth continues. And that's a, including New Zealand, as you can see there. And that's actually a great, it's a great advance. It's a, it's demonstrates to me that clearly, I mean, uh, that technological improvement and innovation is one key important piece of what it means to get back within planetary boundaries. I think that it's fair to say both degrowth. So I'm just going to interrupt you one minute. I can just see several people say, oh, I'm afraid there's a, there's a split experience in the chat. Some people can see it and some people can't. Okay, I, you, I think some people can see it. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, uh, no, no. Why do you keep going? Because actually some people can. I, I certainly can. And I'm sorry that not everybody's able to see see your slide but sorry do keep going no no um i think great. people are try and adjust their screen i don't think there's anything you can actually do so some no, some people have left the point so you just keep going sorry no no worries okay then what we see green growth in some countries in some cases actually even absolute decoupling but the key question then of course is that if we're talking about decoupling and growth that we need to think about relative decoupling, which means that it's just 
emissions are growing slower than GDP is growing, or absolute decoupling, which actually means that emissions are falling as, as GDP is growing. But the key question, of course, is what is the boundary, right? What is the target? How fast and what is the rate and the speed and the scale of decoupling that is needed? And if we talk about sufficient absolute decoupling, then it would look like this, that we're getting back down below planetary boundaries. And what we don't see is, is any country approaching that level of decoupling at the scale and the speed that is required. We can also think to, yeah, uh, that's handy. So in, go ahead, Kate. Okay. I just, I just um, so what you actually see when you look at New Zealand's data, I think you see at most around a half a percent a year of the absolute decoupling can achieve. Whereas Kevin Anderson and Alice Bowes in 2011 took uh, took data without worrying about the political um, political appetite of hearing the news to a, a climate scientist, and they said, "Look, high-income countries should be sufficiently absolutely decoupled from around eight to ten percent a year. That's what's required." So yes, there's absolute decoupling, but it's nothing close to the speed and scale that's required. And if this feels like hard news, it is hard news. And it's true for all of high income countries so far. There's not a single high income country that's demonstrated its ability to decouple to sufficient absolute decoupling at the speed and scale. Okay. And, therefore, and therefore, just to pick in here, what do we do with that? What do we do with the fact that the evidence to date, and all evidence is by definition from the past, so it's not the future, but it's the evidence from the past, but there's no evidence that any nation is, is sufficiently absolutely decoupling. We're only just talking about carbon here. It's also true, it's even more true, that it's inadequate when it comes to actually the whole material, other material footprints. So to my mind, you say, well, the green growth is, it's almost like you just want to cross your fingers and say, well, something will come good. Some technology will come through. And I, I think, you know, you lie in bed, uh, lie in bed awake at night. What, what kind of technology are they going to ultimately justify by the point that it's so desperate that we have to have some terrible geoengineering to try and rectify this schism between GDP and this decoupling required? We think there's an ethical obligation on high income countries like ours to not only do everything they can to decouple, but to remove the structural dependency on endless GDP growth, to stop having to have an economy that thinks it needs that GDP going up and up and up and up and up endlessly, and actually to say, what is it that structurally requires us now to pursue growth, and how do we remove that structural dependency? Now, that's a, easy to say, and a really big existential question of the 21st century. How do we Right. We have inherited economies that need to grow, whether or not it makes us thrive. The evidence today says it is not making us thrive. How do we create economies that enable us to thrive, whether or not they grow? And that's the thing. That's the real transformation. And it's fascinating to presenting this to you in a, in a treasury that is so immersed in the 20th century uh, created and inherited model where, of course, growth is built in and expe expected and needed and required because we've structurally become dependent. That's great, thank you. We've got a time for a couple more questions. I just have one, maybe if you just answer just quickly and then I'll, I'll find a final question here, but what's the, how, how do you put population into this equation? So um, more pe people meaning more consumption leading to more overshoot. I think that's partly to do with the way you're measuring this in terms of per capita terms on a consumption basis as well. But just if you could give any reflections on how you think population feeds into this equation or feeds into the donut, I should say. He's in the donut. I'll, I'm happy to jump in there. Um, here is the donut. So one of the questions we ask is, what is it that will determine whether or not we can meet the needs of the planet? What, what, what will determine our ability to, to get into this space? And one of the first things that we should talk about is population. And I often will talk about it first because it's important to recognize it. The more people there are, it takes resources to meet people's needs for health and education, food and housing. So the scale of the entire human population matters. And yet, if we're going to talk about population, we definitely need to talk about inequality. Right? I, I, they're like two sides of the same rectangle. You, you can't do justice to talking about one without talking about the other. 
The stat that I put up earlier is that the richest 1% of the world own half of the world's wealth. So when we look at much of the overshoot that's going on, at least half of this climate overshoot is due to the top 10% of people in the world. So if we really want to combat within planetary boundaries, it's not just a matter of saying, oh, it's about the number of people. No, it's about the great scales of inequality in the world. And then here's the good news story, if I come back here. What is it that enables country after country after country to go from having, say, seven children, a, a woman having seven children in her family? If we go back to our great grandmothers, and we are, we, if we could ask our great grandmothers how many brothers and sisters you have, they'd probably say something like five, six, seven. Um, I'm one of two children, it's very common, you know, 2.12 two, two children. So these nations have gone through that transition. What is it that enables that to happen? This is something we do know that around the world, again and again, when women and girls, when you have girls, so women's empowerment, gender equality, when girls get to go to school, when babies survive past the age of one, past the age of five, that mothers actually have, a, have the ability to believe that their child will survive. When women are empowered to work and have voice, these factors have a very strong determinant and when women have access to reproductive rights, these enable women to take control of their choice of the size of their families and to believe that their family will actually thrive. And that's when women choose to have far fewer children. So if I put it in another way, if we really want to stabilize the world's population, which is a necessity, the best way to do it is to get out of everybody out of the whole of the donut, because then people have the stability and the trust that they will thrive and the ability therefore to choose to have a smaller family. That's what history has shown us time and time again. So get everybody out of the donut's hole and will enable us to stabilize the world population, which is a necessity. Thanks, Kate. We're we just about at the end of our allocated time, but I do just want to ask this last question, which says the donut is 11 years old. It has been unrolled. What's next? What's the current edge of your insights and what are you learning about the movement to a sustainable world? Just if you could spend one or two minutes, I guess, I, summing up in a sense where you've got to and where you want to go to next, that'd be great. And then I'll need to draw this to a close. Okay, I'm going to point to Dr. Fanny because he has a lot to say about that. But... <laughs> wow, well, well um, I'll, I'll start and then I'll ask you to, to wrap up, Kate. But um I guess the the most immediate thing when you say unrolling the donut is it it's to me it's it almost leaves the next question is how do we then re-roll the donut if we've unrolled it to open up space between the ecological ceiling and the social foundation and we can ground local aspirations and global responsibilities and start taking those into account then how can we then re-roll that back into a, a picture that that a place or a country can can look at and say, ah, there's my donut. Like not that not that two dimensional uh, caricature with phosphorus shooting off in a weird direction that I didn't understand. But you know, taking into account what it means to actually thrive here with people and with the environment, as well as respecting the well being and the health of others and the whole planet, and and start seeing that to be visualized. That to me is the next. The next big step that I'd like to see where it goes. And to add to that, we, we want to track it over time so that at the moment what we have is a, a single phase, like this is snapshot of the world, but of course we want to know well which direction is this going, are things getting worse or better, so we're currently working on creating this over time um, and up, up upgrading it and updating it. Um, this is an evolving concept and we want to keep it alive so that it keeps moving, it doesn't get, it's not static. It's evolving, the, what, what remains true with it is this is about uh, unbearable critical human deprivations and we want to eliminate those in the world to meet the rights of all people. And this is about critical ecological degradations and evolves with the science and evolves as planetary boundary scientists learn more and more about the interdependence and the best ways to measure these. But that's the data story that we want to keep telling so that we no longer have politicians standing up in Parliament, well, in my country going, what we're here for is growth, growth, growth. I feel like I'm in the 1960s. It's a very weird deja vu. But uh, uh, speaking to the metrics of life, the metrics of life, which are not expressed in GDP, 
They're expressed in human thriving. Are the people thriving? They're expressed in planetary health, this only known living planet in the universe. We can have politicians standing in parliaments giving a state of the nation report year on year reporting against this the dashboard of life in her own terms and that for us is a vision and, and that I think I'm going to connect back to the living standards framework which I would say amongst many, many nations that is a framework that is moving towards moving towards this vision of life expressed in her own terms and how do we make the data of this sufficiently rich, sufficiently regularly reported that it actually becomes the new normal. And, and why would you listen to someone say, oh, GDP has gone up by 1.2%. What does that actually actually tell me about life, how it's lived and the future prospects for our children's children? This will give us a much stronger compass that we need alongside many other world views. And I hope, and, I, and I'm thrilled every time that we're invited into dialogue with really, whether it's uh, Maori communities in your nation or Hawaiian indigenous knowledge scholars or the community in Bhutan inviting us into conversation in the to national happiness. Can this be a way that the Western economic mindset recovers and moves back, as I said earlier, towards wisdom that many other cultures have long held? Thank you, Kat. Um, it's very sad, but we are going to have to draw this to a close now. But that has been a, a really fascinating discussion. And we thank you so much for, for giving us some of your time to talk through talk through the donut with us today and also I guess to, to provide some challenges for us but also some some ways where we can kind of start making some progress as well. Um, thank you to everybody who has also joined us online today and for the fascinating questions that have come through the chat. I apologise for not getting through all of them. Um, please keep an eye out for our final session in the Wellbeing Series Seminar which will take place in early April. Uh, we've have a, we're, we're hoping to have an exciting panel lineup uh, to share their perspectives on priorities for improving wellbeing of New Zealand and I'm sure they'll be drawing on some of the concepts that we heard today as well. So please let me now close our seminar today uh, and farewell you all with the Whakatauki. Um, the proverb is about, uh, says that discussion, learning, understanding and knowledge underpin the well-being of all New Zealand, uh, of all people. So, mā te kōrero, ka mōhio, mā te mōhio, ka marama, mā te marama, ka mātou, mā te mātou, ka ora, te iwi, te iwi. Homie, Huye, Taikie. Thank you everyone for attending. Kakite.